Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you, welcome everyone on the call to Congressman Golden's listening session focusing on the impacts of the coronavirus on small businesses. If you have comments or questions for our panel, um, you can dial star three at any time to be connected to our question line. And at the end of the call, everyone will have the opportunity to leave a message for the congressman, and our office will be sure to respond to you as soon as possible. If you do ask a question, um, we'd like you to keep your questions short and to the point so that we get to hear from as many people as possible. And with that, I'll turn it right over to Congressman Golden. Well, I want to thank you all for joining the call tonight and taking time out of your evening to speak with us. I don't need to tell you that we are experiencing challenging times for the state and for the country right now, and I know that Small businesses are really feeling the economic impacts of the uh, coronavirus uh, and the response to it, uh, which is creating uh, you know, such terrible devastation to the economy and creating uh, impossible choices for, for many small businesses and, and the way in which revenue has just been completely cut off. Uh, I recognize that the next couple of months are going to continue to be very tough uh, for all of us, uh, but for our businesses uh, and workers in particular. And that's why we're holding the event tonight. We're here to listen, but we also uh, will do our best to answer your questions and hopefully provide some helpful information to you. Um, I'm very uh, pleased and, and feel fortunate to have several guests with us to lend their expertise. We have Amy Bassett, Director of the Maine Small Business Administration, Dana Connors, the President and CEO of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, Todd Mason, President of the Maine Credit Union League, and Chris Pinkham, President of the Maine Bankers Association. And I want to thank each one of you for joining us. I also want to thank you, uh, particularly Amy, uh, and you and all the folks at Maine, uh, at the Maine Small Business Administration, as well as Todd and Chris. Um, I want to extend thanks as well uh, to the people uh, at the banks, uh, the lenders, and all their employees. Uh, all three uh, of you have people um, who are parts of your organizations who are working incredibly hard to try and make a positive difference to help uh, businesses right now in, in the state of Maine. And, and for Director Bassett uh, and the entire Small Business Administration, uh, you know, the work that's been done, standing up a completely new program in one week's time and in the last uh, roughly one week, uh, we have seen uh, almost a third uh, of the dollars set aside to help small businesses approved uh, and some disbursements getting out to small businesses. But as you know, um, you know some hiccups, uh, which was expected uh, with the rollout of a completely new program uh, and many small businesses, no doubt, on the line who have questions and concerns that they're hoping they can get some answers for tonight. So I want to thank you uh, for your willingness to, to be a part of this call. Uh, I'll tell you folks, uh, I don't want to take up any more time other than to say that uh, I'm, I'm confident many of you are calling in about the new Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loans through SBA. Uh, you, you can, you know, you'll have questions for the director uh, of the SBA here in Maine, but also for lenders, and, and we're going to do our best to answer them. We've got about an hour, so I'm going to get right to uh, the questions. So thanks again for joining the call. Uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Nick to start the first question. Thanks, Congressman. Um, we'll go to uh, Steve now in Bangor, who has a question for our uh, in our online uh, forum. He asks, are banks being flexible with business owners who have mortgages? It's not clear to me if those are covered through any of the SBA programs. Can businesses get mortgage deferrals, not just forbearance, for their real estate loans? That's a question from Steve in Bangor. This is Thanks a for the question. I think this is a good one for uh, for the, our for Chris and, and Todd uh, with our lenders. Uh, this is uh, Todd Mason, President and CEO of the Maine Credit Union League, and uh, I would say think of your credit union, think of your bank uh, as your financial first responder. Um, Credit unions and banks uh, all over the state are working with uh, businesses and consumers alike, um, trying to uh, help uh, respond and find the right program 
to help uh, help small businesses through this uh, through this time of need. Um, I would say that every situation is unique, uh, which is why it has to start with a conversation with your financial institution, with your lender, uh, but in many cases they are willing uh, to work with you. Uh, with our credit unions, 100% um, of them are doing something in the form of COVID relief, and that's everywhere from uh, emergency loans to skip the pay to restructuring loans to reducing fees uh, to doing just anything and just about anything that they can, but each situation uh, is unique, so I would suggest uh, starting that conversation uh, with your lender. I would just add to that, this is Chris Pinkham from the Maine Bankers. Um, the same uh, is true for all of the banks in Maine, but I would um, suggest that Steve might want to take a look at the Paycheck Protection Program. The PPP uh, does have an aspect of it where there is an opportunity for a business uh, to include as part of the calculation uh, their mortgage or rent payment. Um, that would be up to you in terms of the application, uh, but I would uh, suggest that's an opportunity to explore in addition to opening the lines of communication if they already have not done that with their lender. Thank you. I'd like to remind folks if you just joined us that you can dial star three at any time during the call to ask a question to the congressman or a member of our panel. That's uh, star three, and you'll be connected with uh, someone on our question line. Uh, we'll go to another online question from Renee in Freiburg. Renee asks, is there a way to check the status of my economic disaster loan application? That's a question from Renee in Freiburg. Thank you, Renee. Uh, I'm thinking uh, that probably uh, Chris and uh, Todd may have some input uh, based upon how lenders are, are able to check in on this, but uh, Director Bassett may also uh, be able to tell you uh, whether or not SBA uh, has a way to help people check in on the status of their loans. Sure, so um, thank you for the opportunity to join. And for the economic injury disaster loans, um, we know this process started in Maine back on March 17th, and uh, there are still folks waiting to find out um, and there was a lot of loans in the queue. So currently speaking, um, always feel free to reach out to our office. Our phone number is 622-8551, but the direct number and email address to check on an economic injury disaster loan status is 800-659-2955, or by email, disastercustomerservice at sba.gov. Thanks, Director Bassett. We're going to go now to Nick from Holden, Maine. Nick, go ahead. What's your question? Uh, Nick, are you on the line? All right. I'll, uh, Nick is, uh, Nick's question has been, uh, entered in by our team, and he asked, my business has been approved or f and funded. Um, several employees have gone on unemployment and are enrolled. Should I take them back under PPP or leave them on unemployment? That's Nick from Holden. All right. Thanks, Nick, for reaching out. Uh, Director Bassett, do you, do you want to uh, try and field this one? Sure. Um, we are not the experts on unemployment, and the State of Maine Department of Labor has a tremendous FAQ on their website with a lot of great questions and answers and has all the information. But um, if your business has obtained a PPP loan, and the purpose of that loan really is to uh, use it for payroll costs, so um, if you want to maximize the ability to get a part of the loan or most of the loan forgiven, you're going to have to use those loan proceeds to pay people, to pay those wages. So um, ultimately, um, you know, it is a choice of the employee how they want to proceed, but um, we know that people in Maine work hard and we know they want to retain their jobs. And while um, it might seem, you know, like they have some options at this point, and they certainly do, um, I would certainly 
encourage everyone to pay their workers. Um, we know some businesses can't be open, but still um, find a way to pay the workers so that the, that money is getting pumped back into the economy like it should be. And again, if you aren't able to pay those workers, it could impact your forgiveness ability on the loan. Director Bassett, maybe I'll ask a follow-up here on behalf of the um, individual who wasn't able to connect, but I think what also is probably at the spirit of their question is a lot of businesses are reaching out to us, and I'm sure to you as well, with concerns about whether or not they will be able to meet the uh, standards for having a loan forgiven uh, if they're in a scenario where they've had to let people go. They've now been approved for the loan, and many of them are, are worried you know, if I've had to lay off 10 people, what if I'm only able to bring um, five of them back and, and the other five opt not to uh, return to work? Will, will I be able uh, to still, you know, uphold my uh, obligations sufficient to apply for forgiveness for my loan? Does SBA have any um, guidance for, for that type of a scenario? Right. So there is a window of opportunity. So once the loan closes, the small business owner has up to eight weeks to complete um, paying these wages. So, um, you know, if there is a way to spend that money on less employees or something along those lines, those may be things to explore. These are some of the finer point details that we're hoping to see some clarification on soon. But we're hearing a lot about um, businesses concerned with being able to maximize uh, the forgiveness. Um, one other possibility may be that ultimately you take a smaller loan uh, to sort of bring down your ratio uh, so that you can be certain that you are qualifying. Um, and then perhaps you could use another uh, financial assistance product to pay some of those other expenses. It, you can use uh, a minimum of 25% for other things. There are some other eligible costs, but I know everybody is very focused on the, the challenge of, of paying workers when they can't work or they may not want to come back to work. Thanks, Director Bassett. We're going to go now to uh, John and Paula and Turner. John and Paula, go ahead. Hi, Jared. It's John and Paula. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Very well, thanks. Hey, listen, you know that, John, keep up the good work, first of all. We're really proud of you. Um, secondly, you know that John is sole proprietor. Are any of these... Um, stimulus packages something that he might be able to tap into? That's a great question uh, and thanks for calling in and I'm going to let um, I'm going to let Amy uh, talk about the differences between uh, you know qualifying for these programs as, as someone who is self-employed or, or a sole proprietor or uh, you know contractor status uh, she can help talk you through that. Thank you. Thank you for that question because I just saw multiple times in my emails today that I don't know, there seems to be some misconception out there about sole proprietors and their eligibility for the PPP program. So I welcome any opportunity to clarify. And it is very clear, it is spelled out very clearly in the Act, it's spelled out very clearly in the interim final rule that. Uh, sole proprietors are eligible to apply. I think the challenge sometimes may be, and this may be the challenge that the advisors are struggling to help them overcome, is how do you document payroll costs? Because I think people are thinking, oh, it's not payroll because it's me. It's my business. But you are an employee of the business, even though it's just you. So what you are paid is the payroll cost. And how you document that would be whatever financial tax returns or financial statements or uh, bank records and that type of thing in order to be able to document payroll costs. And again, in that uh, act, it is very specifically broad about compensation is included. So the other group that we've had a little confusion on is some businesses actually um, have workers that do work for them, but they, they're not um, direct employees. They may be contractors, and they may pay them in a different way. They may pay them through a 1099 process. So the act, again, was very specific in that the income paid to 1099 employees is not 
eligible payroll cost for a small business because that person that gets the 1099 income is technically an independent contractor and they in of themselves are eligible to apply individually as a, they're deemed as a small business themselves. Thank you, Amy. Paula and John, I hope that's helpful information for you and thanks for calling in from Turner. Hope you're doing very well. All right, we're gonna go now to Ryan up in the county. Ryan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, kind of a follow-up question to um, that last one. I understand what the director mentioned about uh, deriving income for sole proprietors from tax returns, but where I'm finding issues is the different lenders have different interpretations of what information on those um, uh, tax return or bank record documents to use. So I'm wondering if there's going to be some actual hard guidance from uh, SBA on what exactly they should be looking at on those tax returns. Uh, most seem to think that Schedule C is the place to look, uh, but there's difference of opinion as to where on Schedule C they should be looking for the income that uh, sole proprietors take uh, to operate. I can... I can uh, guess that uh, that Director Bassett may uh, be the best one for this, uh, which is the case with so many uh, questions. But uh, I want to make sure I'm not excluding anyone. So if, if any of our uh, representatives from the lenders have any feedback about what they're hearing from their members, please feel free to chime in. I would defer to Amy on the technical answer, but we are – receiving about every other day uh, FAQs uh, from the Treasury and the SBA, which are posted on the sba.gov website. And uh, I'm not at this point aware that we've had any FAQs that specifically talk about where on the schedule that information should be um, derived. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but I'm not sure I've seen that yet. Yeah, and again, I think this is something we uh, internally here in Maine and throughout New England, um, I work very closely with my counterparts in New England, and we are frequently bumping into similar questions. And this is something that we've, it's been made clear to us that it is eligible, but I think we need to take it a bit further and get some more clear to, uh, advice. And we have a great system of getting word out to our lending partners through the associations as well as direct contact on our own. And I'm jotting a note to myself that uh, this is uh, multiple times this has come up just today. So I will work on getting very clear guidance out to the lenders and also to the business advisors. I think sometimes they're a little confused too. And I want to make sure that we're all talking from the same page and that we're all on the same page. So thank you for that question and we'll we'll do our best to get some more detailed clarification to the lenders and to our partners. Thank you for fielding that. Before we move on to the next question, let me just say uh, to everyone uh, that anytime you have a question uh, and there's a need for follow-up, don't hesitate. Uh, to reach out to my congressional office uh, to get your contact information, and we can certainly forward that on uh, to the SBA uh, or, or uh, the other folks on the on the line who can get you some help. Uh, that way, we make sure you do get the follow up that that you're looking for. Thank you. We're going to go to um, Holly and Scott and Ellsworth. Holly and Scott, go ahead. Pardon me. One moment. Holly and Scott, go ahead. I apologize. That's all right. Hello. Um, we have questions, one per business. So um, my first question was about the um, the disaster loan and the possible grant. You can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay, could you hear me before or is this, uh, I didn't want to start over unless you needed to. Um, okay, so 
the grant that you could possibly get, I had been reading somewhere that it was dependent on how many employees you had. Is that accurate or not accurate? I had not heard that, but if that is the case, then someone can correct me. Hi, this is Amy. Um, so it's technically, um, and this was another portion of the CARES Act, uh, so it did not come out right at the beginning when the economic injury disaster loan was available. So that has caused a little bit of confusion, but it is um, available now because of the CARES Act. So what that is, it is up to $10,000 that can be potentially forgiven. So we want to make sure that everybody, um, when they made that idle loan application online, that they checked the box so that they would be in the pool of eligibility for that economic injury disaster loan advance. And so mm -hmm. once it is um, processed, that SBA loan processor will determine up to $10,000, how much will be forgiven on behalf of the business. Um, there had been some guidance put out there, and um, I'm not sure it was 100% accurate on that factor per employee. So that what I just provided is the most current guidance, and it lines up with what the congressman was stating as well. Okay. Um, and then the second question pertains to my husband, who is more of an independent contractor, um, and he's trying to figure out what to apply for. And my question is, if he applies for the disaster loan, can he also apply for unemployment, um, or does he have to choose one or the other? And I guess the fact that he could do the PPP loan was new information that we just got tonight, so I didn't know he could apply for that as well. So now we have three to choose from, but... Director Bassett, I think um, my my reading of that is that um, you know, certainly he could apply for. I don't think there's anything that would stop someone from applying for unemployment, um, given uh, the situation that they're in, um, while also applying uh, for something like uh, PPP. Now, you know, certainly you might. You I don't think you can be. You can't do both, um, and so, but not knowing. Um, how long it might take uh, to get a reply, and I don't think contractors can apply for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program until April 10th. Um, so someone might start the process of applying for unemployment now uh, and have to choose, um, you know, between the two later. Um, but geez, you know, with the, such historically high unemployment numbers, uh, that's a very long process as well. So I wouldn't want to tell someone uh, to wait. Uh, but perhaps to start the process uh, for both. But if I'm giving bad uh, advice there, I'm sure that Director Bassett would, would correct me. Yeah, it's we get a lot of people asking um, what's their best option, and ultimately it's that person, that business owner's decision, whether or not um, you know it, it is the unemployment route versus the PPP. But again, just to be clear, if you go for the PPP loan, the bulk of those proceeds have to be used for payroll. So if you're thinking that you're going to go the unemployment route, it really wouldn't make sense to go for that loan because you're not going to be paying yourself payroll. You can't pay payroll and collect unemployment at the same time. And the economic injury disaster loan could be used for other things, so that might be something to think about. You could have both. Uh, but So the economic injury disaster loan is really designed to help people with their immediate cash flow needs and also their cash flow needs in the future. So aside from payroll, that loan product can be used for paying bills, uh, paying um, utilities, paying loan payments. Uh, so that could be something that might be helpful. And there's some extended, um, you don't have to make payments on those loans once the loan closes. You don't have to make any payments for 12 months. So that's another added breathing room. And then when you're approved for an economic injury disaster loan, you also have up to 16 months to decide whether or not you want to take it. So sometimes it's better to apply and give yourself options rather than, um, you know, not doing anything. Thanks, Director Bassett. I'd like to remind everyone, if you joined us recently, that if you have a question, please dial star three, um, and you'll have the opportunity to talk to our 
um, question team. But now we'll go to Judy from Lexington. Judy, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, I am a small business owner. I own a campground in Maine and just wonder if I'm eligible for anything to do with the economic disaster loan. Uh, as of right now, of course, we're shut down. We have no idea if we're going to be able to open this year, which is going to be a, a big letdown. We have over 50 seasonals that uh, are planning to come in and stay with us for the year, and, and uh, we just don't know where we stand as far as any money from SBA or anybody that might be available to us. Thank you, Judy. It's possible uh, that someone might want to clarify the kind of uh, status that you have, uh, as you know, uh, in regards to how your business is set up. But I'll, I'll uh, probably kick this one over to Director Bassett. Sure. I um, we do like to provide clarification um, because whether businesses, you know, had to close or are closed just due to seasonality, which is a lot of businesses in Maine. Uh, so the act reads that any business that is in operation as of February 15th of 2020 is eligible to apply, and your business would certainly be eligible. Even though you weren't having campers at the campground, um, you were still in operation, so that wouldn't make it ineligible. Um, and because you don't have recent payroll records, there's some very specific dates that people look at, because of the seasonal nature of your business, they do allow those businesses to look back at the similar time period in 2019. So if you did want to um, investigate that, um, and Chris mentioned the FAQs on our website, which is sba.gov forward slash paycheck protection. And in there, there's a very detailed response and answer to the question about how they treat um, the cases of seasonal businesses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to one of our online questions. This one comes from Dave and Holden. He says, my bank isn't participating in the PPP, but when I tried to get a PPP loan from another bank, they told me they won't be able to help me because I don't have an existing relationship with them. Why is that? That's from Dave and Holden. Thank you, Dave. We get this question uh, uh, frequently uh, when we do these types of calls. So um, I think we will ask uh, Chris and, and Todd uh, if they can take this one. Certainly. This is Chris from the Maine Bankers Association. Uh, we have a situation of an overwhelming number of customers that are calling to set themselves up to apply for the PPP program. Um, the relationship that banks have, lenders have, with most of those people would be a credit relationship where we have already established to meet the requirements uh, of federal law, uh, which is a combination of know your customer under the BSA Act. Uh, those responsibilities require us to know about the beneficial ownership of a company and all. So because they're already customers, we have that information, we have moved to process those loans first. That's not to suggest that banks are not going to take non-customers in the future and that if you have a relationship with any type of lending institution, even if it's only a deposit relationship, you should continue to speak with them and ask when they'll be ready to do that. But the sheer volume that has taken place over the last five days, let me just take a moment here to remind people that in a period of really two weeks, we've had the signature of the CARES Act and its uh, implementation uh, only a week ago, taking applications and managing through the system, frankly, as the SBA and the Treasury Department built all of the back office infrastructure to support this has been one incredible project. And we're actually moving forward in the last 24 hours, money is actually going out of banks into the hands of customers under the PPP program. 
only 48 hours ago, we were simply getting loan approvals. So we've really moved a long ways. I know asking people to have patience in these difficult times is a real challenge, um, but I really believe that those customers that are in the queue at this point in time will be um, dealt with fairly and they'll be satisfied with their end result. And at that point, we'll be able to get to additional customers, particularly those that do not have a relationship. And to, to add to what Chris said, uh, just just keep heart. Um, you know, part of the process um, included on the financial services side is one: in order to provide these types of loans, you either need to be already uh, part of the SBA program, um, or applied uh, to become part of it since then. And that application uh, just became available to financial institutions um, as of, I believe, Friday of last week. So. There are credit unions and banks that were already um, able to provide these types of loans because of their existing relationship out of the gate, uh, but there are more uh, being at it uh, every single day. Uh, your, your credit union, your bank wants to figure out ways to help you, um, so I just you know, keep your patience and, uh, and keep, uh, keep looking at it. And again, to give you a sense of what we're seeing out, um, out and about, um, there's a a credit union up in uh, Aroostook County uh, that's already given out 70 loans, another in Aroostook County that's given out 25, and there's you know, similar stories all over the state. And what's great about this is it's, these are lo we're seeing loans as small as two or $3,000 up to a, a million plus, and they're for marinas, they're for marine products or restaurants, they're health clinics, they're daycares, and the list goes on and on and on and the types of businesses that are, are being helped. So continue to work with your financial institution. Continue to work with your lender. Uh, they want to help. And if uh, one's not available, there, there are others that are, are trying to, to, to get geared up to be able to help. Thanks, Todd. We're going to go now to Jonathan in Bar Harbor. Jonathan, go ahead. Hi. I own a small family business, um, Seasonal in Bar Harbor, Maine. I have 24 cottages. Um, because of the lack of knowledge of whether we're going to open or not this season, I'm pretty scared. Normally, uh, the deposits, I require deposits by check uh, prior to arrival when they make their reservations, and that's what we open and survive off during the spring. And this year, due to the fact of lack of reservations and a lack of taking um, deposits, um, not only, you know, am I looking at a situation where, you know, I'm have, going to have loan payments, mortgages, you know, electric, you know, just general everyday things, um, my money is starting to wane. Um, and I'm just getting fearful due to the fact that last year was a good season, but prior to, they did the Route 3 construction um, right in front of our place. So those were two off seasons, and you just you just don't make up for that season in another season. And this will be my 31st season, and it's family-owned. And unfortunately, in Bar Harbor, one of the few family-owned lodging places that still exist. So that's kind of the situation I'm in. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, Director Bassett, I don't know if you have any uh, feedback. I mean, it sounds like there might be uh, at least a couple of options uh, between EIDL or, or PPP. Sure. Um, and you mentioned that you had some loans already. And one of the things, again, there's a lot to that CARES Act um, that we don't get to talk about. But another component of that is if you have an existing SBA guaranteed loan or an SBA 504 loan or an SBA micro loan, there was funding in that act that would pay six months worth of payments on those loans on behalf of the businesses. So anybody who has a current SBA loan of one of those types, definitely reach out to your lender. We're working on those details like a lot of other details, but that is in that act and that is uh, something that they're in the process of working on. Um, and I would uh, say definitely consider an economic injury disaster loan because 
what the situation you're describing is sort of exactly what they're for. It's for the the impact and looking forward. And we know right now that we don't know how long this impact is going to last. Um, so those loans, uh, when they're processing those loans, they look out 6, 9, 12 months um, to, to try to help you calculate what might be your working capital needs. And I know more debt is many people are debt adverse, and I respect that, and I completely understand that. But um, sometimes, you know, it really makes sense at these lower interest rates with the longer term of 30 years, um, you know, the first 12 months of payments are deferred. Uh, so you can really give yourself a breather for quite a bit of time for a whole nother season, perhaps, that um, might be enough to kind of help you get in a little better stable position before you have to make the loan payments. Thank you. We're going to go now to Lindsay in Mount Chase. Lindsay, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I own a lodge up in Mount Chase, and uh, we were recently uh, approved for the PPP loan, which um, was very exciting, um, <laughs> as exciting as it gets, I guess. Um, I, got a, I received a note from my bank this afternoon um, after I was told that we were going to be closing in the next five days that stated that the employees need to be brought on immediately after the loan closes um, in order for the loan to be forgiven. Um, and that presents a couple of problems, the biggest one being that we have a stay-at-home order, stay order right now, um, and getting employees back on right now is Im impossible. And then the second one is, being that we are a seasonal business, we don't reopen on a normal year until May 1st. Um, so I guess my question is, if I, get, if I sign on this loan in five days, um, am I going to fall through the loophole somewhere um, where it won't be forgiven because I can't employ people because of the stay-at-home order? Lindsay, thanks for calling in with the question, uh, and uh, hopefully we can get you some accurate information on this. Uh, my personal reading of the CARES Act is that it doesn't require employees uh, to have their workers actively working on the job site um, itself. Uh, I think that certainly Congress's intent uh, was to find ways uh, to keep people working, recognizing uh, that there are stay-at-home orders, uh, that non-essential businesses are closed in many states, uh, and yet people can continue to work and people need to continue to work. We certainly also believe that it's best to maintain the relationship between employer and employee and keep paychecks flowing rather than have people falling on to unemployment uh, unnecessarily if we can avoid that. Uh, and so, you know, I think that uh, a question for you as well is, are there ways for people to work remote, um, rem remotely from home? Uh, if they can't come in uh, to the work site to do specific tasks, are there other uh, tasks that they can perform at home, um, you know, working together uh, and to make sure that you're you're preparing uh, for the season ahead. But I would, uh, of course, ask uh, Director Bassett or others uh, to to weigh in if they have any more specific guidance. So I think um, again, there's the finer tuned details that we need to make a little more clear. Um, everyone, all the lenders have been so focused on originating these loans and now all of a sudden they're catching their breath and it's like, okay, we're going to close them and how do we comply and how do the, the borrowers comply? But from the time the loan is closed, you have up to eight weeks to make those payments and to pay wages. Um, and then it also goes further out that you have up until June 30th to bring everybody back. So hopefully that gives enough of a window of time for things to work out and um, for seasonal businesses to be able to comply. Lindsay, I would, uh, this is Chris Pinkham from the Maine Bankers. I would also add you might want to check back with your lender. Um, as Amy Bassett suggested, these uh, FAQs have been coming out um, a little bit each day. Yesterday, I believe it was, on the 8th, uh, they announce an extension of that closing from five to ten days. Now, I understand they may have received approval a bit earlier, uh, but if that five days is providing uh, some sort of hardship, uh, reaching out to your lender might be, um, this would be a good opportunity. 
Thanks. We're going to go now to Todd and Presque Isle. Todd, please go ahead. Uh, yes, my question is kind of a little different one. Uh, not sure if the forum is, is the right one to be on, but I own a car dealership in in Presque Isle. My question is, um, they got us on the non-essential list, and I'm a small dealership. And are they going to keep us? Our limitations are great, and they come up with more limitations all the time. Um, I'm not really looking for a loan, not really looking for a grant. I'm looking for answers. Can we be open? Can we do business? And can we conduct it safely, which I am doing? Um, they don't want us to have anybody in the building. They don't want us to have anybody on the law. And we're not supposed to do test drives. And to me, that's making it almost impossible for me to run my business. And I just don't know why being, I don't know why they have on a non-essential list anyway. I think car dealerships are very essential, as essential as anything they get on there. And my question is just that. I mean, can we be put on the essential, and do I have to stay home, or can I work? I mean, I, I can't stay home. It's the only income I have. Todd, I appreciate your calling in uh, with this concern, and I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that um, all of the car dealerships across the State are experiencing uh, similar problems and, and likely have been trying to communicate with the governor's office uh, to try and see if there's a way uh, that they can operate uh, safely so that they could be put uh, uh, taken off the non-essential uh, list. I'm familiar with similar situations with other uh, businesses, not car dealers, but other businesses that have been communicating with the governor's office to see you know, if we if we set up our operations this way, if we can maintain uh, social distancing, uh, not only uh, for our employees but between us and, and the public, is there a way that we can get to yes on being allowed to to open up and operate? Uh, and, and all I can tell you is that those conversations, ultimately, a decision uh, that's been put forward by by the governor's administration. And I don't know if you're a member of uh, the any of the car dealership associations or others uh, um, or uh, the Chamber of Commerce, but uh, please do feel free to reach out to my office in Caribou uh, to see if we can at least um, you know, try and, and strike up a conversation on behalf of all uh, car dealerships in your situation with the governor's office. Certainly they're doing their best uh, to find a way to balance the needs of businesses, uh, but also very concerned about public health. I know that's not a uh, firm answer to your question, uh, but that is certainly where uh, the decision point is. Congressman, uh, this is Dana Connors and uh, from the State Chamber. I would back that up because I do know uh, we've not had the occasion to respond uh, in terms of an automobile dealership, but clearly in other instances um, to appeal um, the decision, and in that appeal, as you suggested, to point out the way that you can operate and comply with some of the social distancing requirements and so forth um, helps to prove your case. And I think that, not to put the person on the spot, but I think that the Commissioner of Economic and Community Development uh, Department is one that plays a critical role. Uh, so if an appeal is placed um, with, with the state and in that appeal, to be able to show how you can address and comply with that, I think will prove helpful. No guarantees, but I think it would it would move your issue forward. Just to give you an example uh, uh, of this, um, you know, maybe you can't uh, do test drives. Um, you know, you might be able to, to uh, work around that in in, in some instances, but uh, I know that at car rental places uh, that are still operating. Um, they are uh, not having people into their physical office. They're meeting them outside. Uh, they're limiting, uh, you know, interaction um, and uh, meeting certain, um, you know, kind of cleaning standards uh, after every, every use uh, for each vehicle. But, um, you know, again, I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out to our office. You can find our, our well, actually our Caribou number is 207-492-6009. And, uh, I'm sure that the Chamber of Commerce, uh, like like Dana Connors was saying, would also uh, be happy to try and look into this. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank 
you. We are going to move now to Judson from Belfast. Judson, go ahead. Judson from Belfast, are you there? Are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. All right. What's your question, Judson? So my question is, I have a two-member LLC. I'm a real estate agent. Me and my wife are agents together. We have our own LLC. And we get a 1099 from our employer, um, but we take draws from the LLC. My banker keeps asking me for 19 tax returns. We haven't done 19 tax returns. What other documentation can I give them um, to prove my income? I've given them a financial statement, and I have given them a copy of the 1099 my business receives. It seems like these big banks uh, don't know what they're doing, as far as after talking to my accountant, he went to a smaller bank uh, and he had a business with 200 people that he de deals with and they didn't need nearly as much documentation. Um, so I don't know what else I need to give them, but I mean, I think it's unrealistic to give 2019 taxes when they're not even due yet. Thanks for the question. Chris uh, and, and Todd, uh, do you want to try and field this? Well, uh, let me take the first shot. This is Chris from the Maine Bankers. Um, Judson, I think um, every bank's got a different approach to this. Every lender is looking at this differently. They've all got different internal rules for compliance, so that's one of the issues. Given the extension for the 2019 taxes uh, to July, I think um, that ought to be a point of discussion if you have not brought that up uh, to the lender. I'm sure you already have. Uh, I'm not sure there is specific guidance as to whether or not we have to have your tax return for the window of time for which you're calculating payroll. Um, I defer to Amy on that question, but again, um, we are it's it's sort of it's in motion where we're learning each day about more of the technical answers, and this is one of those areas where it shouldn't seem to be a barrier that because you have not filed your return this year that you can't file an application. So uh, I'm putting it on my to-do list, and Amy, I defer to you as to whether or not um, there's any uh, standard practice in this area. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just chime in, and uh, just appreciation uh, for that question. Uh, those kinds of questions, I know it's you know, maybe uh, frustrating to you um, not being able to, to get your loan process as quickly as you might like um, and just ask for continued patience. But these kinds of questions are so beneficial because they help uh, guys like Chris and myself um, communicate back out to our credit unions and to our, our, our banks and make sure that they can have the right answers and we can drive consistency. And um, Amy has done and her group has done a phenomenal job. And uh, as, the, as, as soon as the guidance comes through, getting it to us so that we can disseminate it and uh, make sure our folks are fully informed on, uh, on what they need to do. But I think Amy will likely have your, your best answer. Do we have to go to our own bank too? I mean, can we go to a smaller bank that's not our bank? Um, if we're running into these roadblocks. Well, the answer to that is the, the lender that you have a relationship with is at this point going to be the, um, the fastest way to do that. But that's not to discourage you from shopping and talking to other uh, financial institutions. They may very well be able to help you. It may not be as rapid because um, their tendency is to work with existing customers. Uh, but if you, as many people do, have an account at another financial institution, um, a phone call to them would be probably well worth your time. And I would add that um, the period of time that you're measuring against um, isn't on those tax returns anyway, um, because the period of time that you're measuring against is back from the beginning of this calendar year forward. So um, not to, I don't want to out anybody on the telephone or anything like that, but maybe the Congressman, if this is something we could follow up with online, um, Again, as Chris has mentioned, this has been sort of, um, a, I hate to say it, but a little bit of a learn as we go for some of these lenders, and it's been really hard to keep up. And maybe we could do a little conversation or have a little educational session um, with some of our lenders to sort of 
help alleviate some of these problems because that that should not be a roadblock. But I'd like to handle that offline if that makes sense to you, Congressman. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'd all, uh, certainly love to try and help convene uh, any way we can to, you know, some kind of uh, session like that as well. I mean, we could do it uh, through a conference call or, or on Zoom or, or, or something. Um, so certainly uh, happy to have you all handle that offline, though. Uh, we can get you, um, if the caller could provide uh, their details, uh uh, to us by calling one of my offices and, and referring to the conversation so that we could pass along your contact information. I think that would be the best way for them to follow up offline. Thanks, Congressman. And that's a, that's a good um, segue to remind folks that after the call is over, you'll have an opportunity to leave a message for the Congressman and our staff, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, also, if you have any additional questions as we um, come to the end of our hour here, please press star three and we'll connect you to our question line. Um, we are going to go now to Paul in Lewiston. Paul, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks, thanks for taking my call. Uh, my wife and I own two restaurants in the uh, Lewiston area and one in the Scarborough area. I've been informed by my bank that the SBA has accepted my application and they've sent a confirmation number. What, what's, uh, what's the anticipated turnaround for approval from the SBA once uh, they've accepted it? And also, uh, I just want to follow up on a point that uh, the uh, young lady from the SBA had made that, uh, that as a restaurant, there's an expectation that if we are, we're allowed to reopen, it will definitely be with a significantly smaller floor plan given the social distancing and or fear of uh, customers. H how will that square with bringing everybody back by June 30th if, if, if the volume of business doesn't support it? Those are my questions. Sure. So um, just to clarify, um, I, bringing workers back by June 30th, I apologize if I used the word all, but that is the deadline for bringing the people back that are being paid. Um, so you may not bring everyone back, but the proceeds from that PPP loan will need to go towards paying wages for people. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be exact same per person type of situation. Um, and then the other thing that I, you know, I don't want to forget uh, to mention is that I know and I completely understand everybody wants to maximize the forgiveness piece, but if there is a portion of that PPP loan that cannot be forgiven and it has to convert to a term loan, uh, the terms are quite favorable for that. It would be a two-year note with 1% interest and the first payment is deferred for six months. There are no personal guarantees. There's no collateral required. There's no fees to the borrower. And there's no prepayment penalties. So, I, again, I know people are um, looking to avoid taking on debt, but if it is, you know, helpful and if it is what it is, uh, those would be the terms of that loan. Regarding the process, um, when this was uh, rolled out, uh, both the SBA and the Treasury Department uh, were very uh, heard Congress, and they heard it, it had to be easy. It had to be streamlined. It's much more streamlined than anything we do in regular times. So we delegated everything to these lenders. So the lender is ultimately making the determination on eligibility, and they're ultimately making the decision on whether that loan can be approved so if that lender has told you that they've input the loan and they have a number, you're approved. So um, again, we're happy to sort of help some of the clarification there, but that's how this process works. So literally a lender can sit there and key in the data uh, that's needed to fill in the boxes, hit submit, and that loan's approved by SBA. They've processed it through this, our system and it's an instantaneous approval. Thank you. Chris and Todd, do you guys have any 
in uh, insight you might share just about what you've seen for turnaround times on the disbursement side? I mean, I know every bank is a little different and every.